My name is Larry Pierce, and I'm excited to be here today to share with you about uh, MSC Apex, and in particular to share how it has reinvented the computer-aided engineering process. <clears throat> so today we're going to talk about some key technologies within Apex that have enabled uh, this change. But we're also going to talk about something really more important, which is the bottom line. In other words, what does this reinvention, how does this affect the bottom line? In other words, <clears throat> excuse me, what are the benefits of this change to your company, to your project, to your manager, and to you? And so let's camp out on that uh, very important question for a moment. So what are the benefits of MSC Apex? And maybe another way of saying this is how do I know this process or this new process is really better. In other words, what is the evidence of that? So today I am, during the course of the presentation, going to offer several examples of the evidence that this reinvented process will benefit your organization and you. And the first piece of evidence that I'm going to offer today shares a commonality with the recent Summer Olympics. Uh, when the athletes are the best at their particular sport. When they win, they get a medal, right? They get an award. And so in keeping with the premise of outstanding innovation, MSC Apex has won over 13 awards in the past two years. Not only is MSC Apex recognized in, in the form of, of awards, but it's also its innovative and unique functionalities are also patent worthy. So we've got a lot filed and several that have been awarded so far. So you know, patents and awards, that does signify something. That does signify that MSC Apex really is uh, reinventing the process. But to you on the call today, it's kind of like a shiny picture on the wall. That doesn't necessarily tell me how it can help me, how it can directly benefit me. Because most of the people on the call today, your manager probably will come by and ask you today, when's the analysis going to be complete? Or what's the margin? Or how do we make this better? So once again, the awards signify something. But let's kind of bring this more down to earth and see how this reinvented process within MSC Apex can actually help make your company, your organization, and you more productive and more profitable. So the traditional, or really the current, computer-aided engineering process relies on CAD geometry that's typically created outside of the computer-aided engineering application. So the geometry is kind of disconnected uh, from the pre, post, solve, pre, and post processing. And the solve the pre-solve post operations, they're also sequential. And they typically require the user to manually manage input and output and solver execution. Additionally, each one of the steps in this process has its own issues. And we've, we've uh, questioned and we've polled a lot of people such as you on the call today uh, to find out what are the issues. And what we learned is, is that most people say that computer-aided engineering software is very difficult to use and to learn. As a matter of fact, more than 50% of the respondents said it took them at least a month to learn new computer-aided engineering software, okay, because of it being difficult to use and learn. Because of the difficulty in learning and using, most people actually find that they don't feel comfortable interpreting the results, okay? Uh, and that's not a good thing, because we, we need to interpret the results to know if this design is good or not, right? Most people say, over 55%, uh, say it takes them at least 30% of their analysis time, sometimes even longer, up to 80% of the analysis times, just to go from geometry to the mesh, because that geometry to mesh operation or process is tedious and very, very error prone. And once you get the mesh, most people say that it takes them several runs with the solver just to debug the model, just to get acceptable and appropriate results. Once again, that's also a time sink that is uh, tedious and also error prone. The end result and the bottom line is that 70% of the respondents said that they did not receive their simulation results in a timely manner. So, you know, that basically means we may have missed our schedule. We went beyond when we thought we were going to be finished. That could mean that we would like to do two projects, but we only did one because that's all we had time for. That could mean that we would like to make the product better, but we didn't have time to do that, okay? That could mean we would like to make more money, but because our process takes so long, 
is so time consuming, uh, we, we, we didn't really make more money this time. So uh, that has a big, big effect on productivity, profitability, how good your product is, and stuff like that. So not only is the current process linear and sequential, it often repeats. As a matter of fact, it always repeats, because change is really the only constant. And oftentimes, when it does repeat, the change really requires you kind of start over, OK? Which means it took you a week to do this, going to take another week because of the change. So that's not very productive, so to speak. So with MSC Apex, we're proposing a new architecture where we've integrated the geometry, a very powerful geometry engine that's specifically designed sort of for computer-aided engineering. So we've integrated that geometry, the meshing, all the pre-processing. We've integrated the solver and solver methods as well. And the post-processing, we've put it all in a single environment. Okay, and what this enables is a complete generative environment. Okay, generative, you hear me use that word today, think automatic model updates. So it creates this generative environment where instead of the old pre then solve then post process, we've replaced it with a new pre and solve and post process. So within this new architecture, once again, we've integrated powerful geometry mesh tools, which you'll see today, and an integrated solver that you'll see today, and integrated solver methods that enable this generative, once again, think automatic model updates workflow. And anytime you have these automatic model updates, you can just think my productivity is really going to improve, OK? Because once again, change is the only constant. So what about APEX enables this change? So let's talk about some of the technology that's here, some of the things that have gotten us the awards, have gotten us the patents. Let's talk about that. And then we'll tie that in to what is the benefit, right? Because that's really what's important to you. So the first is direct modeling. So this enables a uniquely innov innovative user e experience within APEX where the model interactions are not through clunky forms and buttons. A lot of current computer-aided engineering software, to be honest with you, is button forms, is, is, you know, buttons everywhere. Instead of that, you have a rather natural and intuitive gesture, such as push-pull or drag directly on the model itself. So direct modeling is I work directly on the model itself. And you can see that in the animation here, where we are pushing and pulling solid faces or dragging uh, edges and vertices of the solid, okay? Very natural, very intuitive. Uh, and because it's natural and intuitive, makes it incredibly easy to learn and to use. This benefits all models that you may make, but especially benefits those models that are the most tedious and time consuming, where you have a lot of idealization, like in mid-surfacing, or just simple geometry mesh cleanup. One of the things you can notice in the animation that's going on now is that direct modeling is awesome, but because it eliminates a lot of the clunky uh, throwaway construction geometry. But the other thing you should notice in the animation is that there's automatic model updates. You're, you're actually witnessing the generative part of MSC Apex. In other words, as I make these geometry changes via direct modeling, the mesh is automatically updating. Okay, So we're going to see throughout the presentation today that direct modeling plus generative, it yields mesh updates. That's very visible, but it's much more. It's property updates. It's boundary condition updates. And the net result is not just faster geometry mesh clean up, okay? That's awesome by itself. But it really goes much further than that, because this is honestly faster model to results as well. In other words, over the whole process. Now, a lot of times when I talk about direct modeling and a lot of the animations that you see, you'll see like changes in the geometry and then automatic mesh updates or boundary conditions. But this idea of direct modeling, this idea of directly interacting with the model instead of working through clunky forms, it's more than just geometry and mesh and opera meshing operations in MSC Apex. It's everything from direct and graphical and interactive interaction with beams for orientation and offsets. It's direct and graphical and interactive operation with forces as well. Uh, so this direct interaction with the model concept really does make MSC Apex easy to learn and easy to use because it is so natural and it is very intuitive. Now you've already heard me talk about the generative capabilities in Apex. This 
we, we call this the generative framework and it enables the automatic model updates as you change the model. Once again, as you see in the animation on the right, this is easily evident when you change the geometry and you see the mesh automatically update. But it's more than that. As you see on the left, we've actually got a glue connection and the purple and the white elements there represent the elements that are involved in that connection. And as, and as I make changes to the geometry and the mesh updates, then the elements that participate in the glue connection, they also update automatically. So the generative framework within MSC Apex has a huge impact on your productivity, whether it's just a simple mesh update or it is a quick enabler for uh, quick design study iterations as well. So I had, off, I, had, I had promised some evidence of what these benefits are. And so the first piece of evidence was the awards and the um, patents. The second is just taking what we've seen so far in terms of technology, direct modeling and generative, just taking those two pieces of the puzzle, so to speak, enables MSC Apex to give you a huge productivity gain in terms of model preparation. A good example of that is mid-surface mesh generation, all right, which is highly idealized in general. Um, MSC Apex is up to, is 10x and higher, actually, in terms of doing it faster than we currently do it. In the graph, I have four examples. The blue line represents doing it before Apex, in other words, using tools that existed before Apex. The red line represents using Apex. And you can see here that we get a substantial time savings using MSC Apex, a substantial boost in our productivity. Originally, these four models took over two man weeks. With MSC Apex, less than two days, OK? The two models on the left are sort of like typical aerospace, like machined components. And the two models on the right uh, are basically like injection molded plastic parts, which are really difficult uh, mid-surface representations to create, OK? So let's shift gears now. Let's do a short demonstration. And uh, this will be the first of two demonstrations today. And in this one, we're actually kind of going to focus on the direct modeling and the generative capabilities of MSC Apex. So I've actually got a bracket here. And this is actually a machined bracket. And I've already meshed it. So we've already got a mesh. There's all, actually, I've already analyzed it, too. There's already some results. But uh, let me just show you the rest of the model. The scenario here is change has happened, and we know change always happens. So let me show the rest of the model here. I've actually got a couple of additional components. So this bracket is part of a small little assembly here. All right. We've already got some connections here uh, between where the fasteners would be on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, I'm actually using the uh, MSC Apex glue capability, okay, which is ideal for preliminary design studies where I may not actually know where the fasteners are yet, okay. In this case, I actually do know where they are, but I wanted to leverage, I wanted to demonstrate and illustrate glue. In this case, glue is kind of overkill because I'm really maybe connecting. You can see the white and the purple here. Uh, I'm really connecting more than maybe is really connected. Some of that would be touching contact. But this is just a made-up example, so that's OK uh, for, my particular, um, for my particular scenario. So what I want to look at right now is I actually want to just look at this bracket, because this bracket has actually changed. Uh, I've actually got a new design here, and you can see that with the red. And I'm kind of um, you know, superimposing the, t the new model over the existing model. So you can see I've got some additional material here on the right. If you look closely, I've got some additional thickness up in that area. And we've also got a little bit of additional material here on the left. Okay, So let's actually leverage the direct modeling to make this change. Because these changes, uh, although significant, they're not like a complete redesign of the part. And I want to leverage all the work that I've already done. I want to be able to just, you know, I've already done a lot of work. I've already meshed some stuff. I've already um, applied loads and boundary conditions. I've already connected it. And I want to leverage all that so that I don't have to redo all that. Okay? So we're going to come in and we are going to um, 
just use the edge and vertex drag tool and this really does illustrate very well the direct modeling paradigm within MSC Apex where I just simply I want to I want to take the existing model and I just want to fill it inside of the new updated model so I'm just going to drag some edges and vertices here notice Apex tells me uh, before I actually uh, let go of the mouse that hey you know good things are going to happen here all right so let's go in and let's do a few more uh, order really doesn't matter a whole lot here, so we'll just actually drag a few edges, and as we drag edges, we are uh, refilling the volume, so to speak. And notice that you know the mesh is automatically updating for us, so we're getting a totally um, new mesh uh, as a result of this. We are inheriting loads boundary conditions. We are inheriting the original thickness values, but I'll need to update that because I've actually got a new geometry. Here I'll actually uh, drag a vertex, so you can drag vertices. Once again, notice that I get lots of feedback. I get lots of guidelines. I get lots of edges to show me a priori before I actually let go of the mouse that good things are going to happen, that this is going to fill in. I actually have multiple undos and also redos, so I could actually undo, undo, undo if I needed to, if I needed to get out of this situation. if I boxed myself in. So let's just go and complete the process on this other side over here. We'll drag a few edges here and I'm just simply dragging them up to uh, the exist the face of the new uh, solid and we've actually completed. So we've got in just a very few moments here uh, I have made the uh, existing mesh fill the new geometry, okay? Uh, if I looked at the thickness now, okay, I would actually find that the thickness corresponds to what the old solid was. So let's actually update that with the new solid, okay? So we'll do that. So I'll just simply use, we have a, a great tool here that just automatically does this for us. So I'm just going to uh, select the mesh and I will select the solid and Apex is saying you've already got some thicknesses assigned, do you want to override it? And I do because this is a new design, a new solid and so now I've got new thicknesses. I've recalculated the thicknesses uh, and the offsets. So technically if we if we come in here now and we kind of uh, bring back maybe some of our uh, ex other components that we had here, we'll see actually that we've uh, still got our connections. We'll see here that we've uh, still got our glue. The glue is still there. So all that stuff stayed in place. We didn't actually lose any of that uh, extra information or the uh, stuff that we had already defined. So it's still there because MSC Apex is generative. It's automatically updated that. If I actually wanted to come in now and to analyze this model, let's say, Let's actually just set it up for analysis. And this is sort of a preview of something we're about to talk about. Uh, MSC Apex automatically, because of the integrated solver methods, it just automatically checks my model for me to let me know before I run the model that the model is valid and ready to run. In this case, I've got a couple of warnings, but I don't have anything that's saying, hey, you can't run this model. Let's actually introduce a really bad element. Okay, so we'll come in and we'll just pretend that uh, I have created a really bad element. So I'll just drag a node over. If I turn on element quality here, MSC Apex tells me that I've got some really bad elements. As a matter of fact, it says they're invalid. Uh, in other words, the solver would not be able to run this model at all with this element quality. So that's great feedback to get. Um, and you'll notice that over in the analysis readiness panel, now we actually get a red marker. So MSC Apex is saying, hey, you know what? You've got a really bad element here. We will not let you run this model. So let's go in and let's fix this real quick. So I will just show only uh, the invalid elements. And I'll actually grow the mesh a couple of times around that. Um, and now we will actually just say auto enhance the mesh. The mesh is automatically enhanced. You can see that now we are back to a ready status on our analysis readiness. So I could hit the little running man down here and the solution would run. We're not going to run this model right now. Uh, we're gonna, we've got a lot more stuff we want to cover and we want to talk about. But hopefully you've been introduced now to how easy it is to use 
uh, direct modeling, and you've also experienced uh, the generative capabilities within MSC Apex. And you got a sneak peek of something we're about to talk about, which is leveraging the integrated solver methods that are in MSC Apex to not only solve your model and get results, but also check your model before you do that. So this is another change enabler. It's the integrated solver, okay, and the integrated solver methods. And these enable instantaneous checking of connections such as glue, okay? So for instance, in the uh, graphic here on the left, uh, if I make a change to the model that breaks the connection, maybe I move the two pieces too far apart, so now that they're outside of some tolerance, I get automatic notification that, hey, in this case, the glue is broken. I get a little red X. All right, and I get a little exclamation point that should draw my attention that something is, is, is not quite right. Additionally, the integrated solver methods check the model prior to submission for missing materials, invalid element quality. We just saw that. Missing loads. And this is illustrated in the um, image that's here in the middle. This is a concept we call analysis readiness. Is my model ready to actually run? And then lastly, once again, I may have run the model and then I've come back and I've made some changes to the model. Well, another thing about the integrated solver methods and the generative capability is Apex actually notifies me of that. In other words, it says my analysis is stale and I now need to rerun the analysis because I've made some changes to it. All right. All that's enabled by the integrated solver methods as well as the generative capabilities. So another thing about the integrated solver is that traditionally most finite element solutions are based on a solver-centric monolithic mesh. It requires a lot of management for proper assembly and also increases the amount of time required for model debugging and model changes later. With Apex and leveraging the integrated solver, we have a more modern parts modern parts-based approach to solving the model. And we call this computational parts and enables a more parts-based process-centric solution of the model as opposed to a solver-centric um, solution of the model. So in a computational parts um, solution, and you see here in the, um, this on the left represents the traditional process, monolithic mesh, monolithic solve. On the right is the computational parts-based solution in Apex where we actually generate stiffness, mass, and damping matrices for each part on a part-by-part -part basis. We roll these up into sub-assemblies and full assemblies, and then we do the solution, and then we, of course, recover results on all the individual parts. But what this enables is when we modify a part, if you modify a single part, it could be as simple as just remeshing it, right? Uh, we don't have to recompute everything. We just recompute the one that's changed. We roll everything up into sub-assemblies, assemblies, and the net result is a faster incremental solution, okay? So a new concept in MSC Apex is this idea of results exploration. And let's talk about how that's going to uh, make you more productive. We've seen that direct modeling saves you time in geometry mesh operations, plus it's easy to learn and use. We've seen that the generative uh, framework saves you lots of time because you get a lot of mo automatic model updates. We've seen that the integrated solver automatically checks your model for you. Okay, Now we've got the concept of results exploration. And so within the modal frequency response analysis within Apex, We've got this form, we call this the results exploration form, and this allows us to do what if questions to see how we can improve this design prior to running a plethora of additional design iterations, which all cost time and money. So the frequency response results explorer lets us remove modes, scale modes, shift frequencies, change critical damping to evaluate how these model changes may affect the results. Now I'll still need to do a design iteration and actually make a change to the model, but I have a much clearer idea of where the change needs to occur and by how much it might affect the model. So this is the, the net result of results exploration, which the form is once again here is it's going to reduce the number of design iterations that I make, and it'll help me get to a better design much faster. Okay? So let me look at another piece of evidence with regard to uh, Apex, uh, this new reinvented process making things a whole lot better for you. And in this example, 
uh, we're talking about rapid design improvement. In other words, we're sort of putting the whole package together. In other words, direct modeling makes it easier to, and, and faster to make changes to the model or to build the model in the first place. Generative means when I do change it, it's going to automatically update for me. Uh, integrated solver is going to check my model automatically for me. And now results exploration is going to save me time in terms of how many potential design iterations that I might need to do in order to get an improved design. Here is an example. This was a, a, a muffler system. This is not the actual one. I can't show the actual one, but this is sort of a pretend, uh, a, a, a generic something that I can share. But the bottom line is, is that a customer took 10 days, you know, two man weeks to get an improved design, to get their design ready to, so that it was within their specifications. Using MSC Apex, leveraging once again direct modeling for the changes, generative for the changes, integrated solver, and the results exploration, they took 10 days down to two. That's a significant thing. Just once again, think about money savings. Think about, I can do more projects now. And the bottom line here is I've got a superior design. And that should make my company more profitable. And hopefully you as well. Hopefully you'll get a raise for that. Okay? So let's look at this example in particular. Let's look at this in a, in a demonstration here. And once again, this is kind of going to tie everything together that we've talked about today. So this is a real good example to look at. So um, here we have a muffler, uh, and it's attached to the floor panel here. All right, so we've got a subset of the floor panel. The floor panel is constrained, all right? And the muffler itself is actually connected to the floor panel. I've got some little hanger tubes here, and I've got a hanger that's represented by a bushing element, stiffness and damping. It's, it's attached here to the front end, and it's actually hanging here on the back end as well. All right, so that's connecting the muffler to the floor panel to the floor panel, all right? Let me come in here and let me actually hide, let me hide this, um, let me hide this outer shell here real quickly, all right? So we, we can look in, I did a show only, so we'll do a show reverse. Um, so we can look inside the muffler here and we see all these different partitions that we might have here. Um, and you might ask, well, how is all this connected? We've already seen the bushings that are connecting the, um, the muffler itself to the floor panel, okay? Uh, in other areas, we're actually using the apex glue capability, okay? And you can see the elements that are participating in the glue. They are the purple and the white elements. And of course, that's generative if I change the model, that connection region. This is great for something that might be like a, a thermal weld or brazing or something like that. So glue is actually connecting the muffler together, the muffler assembly together. Uh, completely, and then the muffler assembly is connected to the frame with uh, the bushings, okay? And we're going to do a frequency response uh, analysis on this particular model, and um, the, for this analysis, we are going to have an excitation that's coming in on the inlet of the muffler here, and this, this excitation is going to be a unit excitation in X and Z direction, all right? Uh, unit in the X and Z direction. And um, so we've got that, and it's applied once again to the uh, front. And I'm actually going to change my units real quick. I was doing another model today in, in inches, and let's actually go into something that look a little better here. We'll work with some millimeters here. So uh, we've got forces and we've got our input excitation. And if we look at where we're going to calculate the responses, that's what these little triangles are here. Those little triangles, we call those point sensors. I can add as many point sensors as I want to the model. And this is where we're going to calculate the responses for our frequency response analysis. Now, we're going to investigate the model to see where the maximum response would be. I know I'm not, per se, an automotive engineer, but I know a lot of times they'll be interested in what this muffler might be doing to the floor panel, because that might represent some noise going in. 
Uh, but what we're going to find today is that this is the sensor that has the maximum response. And we're not going to be surprised by that because this is basically a floppy cantilever beam out here. So yes, this has the maximum response. And we're going to pretend that we need to actually uh, reduce that response. So I've already done an analysis here. So let's go look at that analysis. We'll go post-process real quick. And we'll look at our results. And we're going to start out by just looking at a few modes here. I'm a stress guy by, by when I did real work, um, but I'm not really a, a dynamicist per se. But I know that people that do dynamics, first thing they're always going to look at is going to look at what the modes are. So let's go and do that. Let's turn on, a, turn on some strain energy here as well, because uh, that's interesting to look at where the strain energy might be. And we'll animate this, and we'll look at some of the modes. So some of the lower frequency modes are effectively rigid body modes on the muffler itself. Okay, uh, we, If we look at some of, if we increase the frequency, if we go a little higher in the frequency, we begin to see some modes of the floor panel. Okay. Uh, so we, we see a bunch of different modes here. We can, of course, you know, rotate and analyze, and we're looking at the strain energy as well. So that's what the modes look like. Let's go look and see what the responses look like. So let's go look at our frequency response results here. Okay. And when I look at the frequency response results, a uh, couple of things to notice. We're automatically we're automatically showing the first one here, all right? And we're looking at, in this case, accelerations in millimeters per second squared. And the colors here on the graph, sort of to make this intuitive and easy to learn, they directly correspond with the colors on our coordinate system here. So red is going to be X, green is going to be Y, and Z is going to be blue. Y represents the uh, magnitude of the translation or the resultant magnitude of the X, Y, and Z components. And we're looking at magnitude here uh, of the acceleration. So let's try to take a quick look and see where the maximum might be. And we already know it's because it, I've already hinted that it's out here on the end of the tailpipe here. But let's just kind of confirm that real quick. So we'll come in and we'll cycle our plot. And we see this is the maximum response. So let's kind of turn on the legend. And sure enough, it is the exhaust pipe. OK, so that, I already knew that. So let's just go back and look at the exhaust pipe. And let's pretend for a moment that we need to reduce that response, that 6,000 millimeters per second squared is really too high. So we want to um, see what we can do to, um, to bring that down. So, so I'll turn on uh, my data points. So these are all the frequencies that we calculated values at. We'll talk about how that was set up in a few moments. But let's just click on our maximum here. We get a modal contributions chart. And let's actually take the little previewer here and let's kind of zoom in or on where the, uh, the modes that are contributing the most. Uh, let's take a look at those and see how these modes are influencing the response, once again, to the sensor uh, that is on the end of the pipe here. So we're going to just, we'll just start here with the lowest one. It's not the most, the one that's contributing the most, but it is um, one of the primary contributors. Uh, let's, once again, let's turn off the outer shell of the muffler itself so we can see what the partitions are doing. Let's turn on our uh, strain energy, because uh, I know a lot of folks doing dynamics uh, like to look at the strain energy as they look at this. So we'll do a uh, animation here. And what we can see in this case, uh, at this particular frequency for this particular mode, we've got a lot of influence from the head of the muffler. And we can also see we have some influence from the stiffness and the damping that might be in our uh, connections there, our bushings. Okay. Let's look at another mode here. And we can see that this particular mode, once again, we've got the stiffness and the damping in those connections, those bushings. That has a big part in this response, as well as the stiffness of the partitions inside the muffler. So we can do the same thing for a couple of the others. Here we're actually getting some interaction uh, with the uh, floor panel. Once again, I know that might be something we would normally be really interested in, but for today we're just going to pretend that went away and we're focusing in on um, 
what's happening out here on the end of the uh, muffler. So we can see that in all of these modes that are contributing the most that the primary influencers are the stiffness and the damping of the um, connections here, which are bushing elements. We can see that the stiffness of the partitions, as well as, of course, in this one here, the, the stiffness of the pipe itself that's going through the muffler. So those are um, the big contributors to the response uh, at that location. So let's go back to our frequency response results real quick. And let's look at the results explorer because maybe it's my job to improve this. Okay, the response is deemed too much. It's too excessive and I need to find ways to reduce that. All right, so let's bring up the uh, results exploration table. We'll sort by the contribution. So now we're looking at the primary contributors. And I'm going to look at two, I'm going to do two what ifs here, okay? And the results explorer is great for what if, all right? Normally, I would have to go back to the model and make some changes and run it and look at the results and make some changes and run it and look at the results. But I'm going to, I'm going to preempt that with doing some what if here on the results I have. Now, we've done a modal frequency response analysis, and so we're actually using normal modes of the structure to basically reduce the size of the model and make the solution more efficient, and this allows us to tweak it for these uh, what if scenarios here. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I know the stiffness and damping of these connections is having a, a big effect. And so I'm going to say, you know what, I can go to the supply room and I can get a different connection that's going to have more damping. And so I'm going to kind of test that theory out by changing the critical damping. This is the modal critical damping. This is the critical damping for these modes. I, these are the biggest contributors. I'm going to change that. And I know that this is not directly the damping in that connection. I know that. But I also know that the damping in those would affect this, right? Okay, so this is sort of indirectly doing that. And what I'm really trying to see is, you know what, if I can increase the damping in the system, so to speak, will I improve my response? And I know the answer intuitively. I know it's yes, and I can confirm that here. All right, I see that I actually have reduced the response from about 6,000 to 5,000. Now, Actually changing it in here may not give me this exact response, but I do expect it to go down, and I have some idea of the magnitude change, okay? So that's the first thing I was thinking about changing. The second thing I was thinking about changing is I noticed in all the modes that I looked at that the stiffness of the partitions played a big role in uh, what the response of the sensor on the end of this was. So if I change the stiffness of the partitions, effectively I'm going to be shifting a frequency. All right. So let's see what shifting a frequency might do for me. So I'm going to pretend I make them more flexible. I don't expect this to help me, by the way. Even though I'm a, not a dynamicist, I don't expect this to help me. But let's just see. Let's just say what if. So I'll reduce this, I'll shift this frequency by 50 hertz, just a made up number, just to kind of see what the trend is and to see if my intuition is correct. And I can see that that really had no effect. So the yellow here represents what the change would be. So making the partitions more flexible shouldn't be helping me. So let's try making the partition stiffer. And absolutely huge effect, drops it down from 6,000 to the maximum response is now 4,000. Actually, the maximum response is over at this frequency here, okay? So I've had a big effect, okay? So I really believe that this might be the route that I want to investigate, all right? So now that I've played what if, let's actually go test this out, all right? And once again, normally I would actually have to do several design iterations uh, to test this out, and now I'm actually going to just have to do one design iteration to test this out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come into this partition that is uh, right here. I'm just going to change this one today, all right? And I'm just going to uh, just show it only. And what I want to do is I want to make it stiffer, 
which basically is I want to increase the thick thickness of it. I'm mostly an aerospace guy. I would think about adding a rib, but since this is automotive, we're just going to make it thicker. And I could make it thicker by just coming in and changing the thickness, all right? I'm not going to do that. That's, that's really easy. I'm going to pretend that my change is a little bit more difficult than that because I want to leverage the direct modeling is here. Maybe my change is not so simple as uh, changing that thickness. So I'm actually going to come in and change the thickness of my solid here. Going to make it thicker by two millimeters. And I'll need to update this radius here as well. Okay, so we'll add two millimeters to that one. All right, now I need to update my thickness. I've updated the solid. Now let's update the thickness on um, the mesh that's here. And we'll pick the mesh. We'll pick the solid. Do you want to overwrite? I'll say, sure, I want to overwrite. So we've also now updated um, that thickness. Great. All right, got a new thickness in our model. I'm going to make one other change here real quick. Let me hide. The, um, that. I'm actually going to come in here and I'm going to shift this partition over a little bit. Uh, maybe, we, maybe we've done this in the past and maybe that was a good idea. So I'm going to shift this guy over. And one of the reasons I want to do this is I want to illustrate the uh, idea here <clears throat> that, I want to illustrate the idea here that the uh, glue which is represented, the elements that are participated are, are this purple and white here. So I'm just going to shift this over just a little bit. And I, what I'll see when I shift it over just a little bit, um, I'll see that the elements that are participating in the glue, that they are automatically updating for me. This is, once again, that generative capability within MSC Apex. So I'm now ready to rerun my analysis. And for those on the call who are uh, do frequency response type analyses, I know you probably have a few questions right now. So before I submit this for analysis, let's kind of go over those. You might be asking, OK, where did we define the damping? Uh, in this case, uh, damping could come in from a material level. So I could actually have a material damping if I wanted to. Damping could also come in on the connections. So um, I can also have damping defined on the connection. In this case, I've got more of a system level damping. I could have the uh, global structural damping if I wanted. But in this case, I'm actually using uh, modal damping. Okay. Um, you may also be saying, OK, well, uh, how many natural frequencies are you calculating? Well, I set that up. You'll notice that my frequency response is going to automatically do the, um, the modal part for me. And in this case, I'm just looking. It's a made-up problem, so so you know, um, no no cards and letters, so to speak. We're going from zero to a thousand hertz, and I I stopped it at 50. I know normally I wouldn't do that, but I want to be able to run it here live. So we're going to stop there. You might also be asking, okay, how did you choose the frequencies that we're calculating the responses at? I did that here in the frequency response area. I'm actually just doing an incremental calculation every 10 hertz from 0 to 1,000 hertz. I could add additional capabilities. I could come in and do a modal spread around my natural frequencies. I got a lot of different options here uh, for defining uh, what, those, what those look like. But we're going to go ahead and run this analysis. It'll take just a couple of minutes to run. While it's running, uh, you, it'd be a good time to be uh, typing in your, uh, the questions that you might have. And let me get my presentation back up. And I have just a couple other things to say. So a few summary slides here while that's running. And we'll check the results uh, to see if my intuition was correct and see if the change to the model. So where do you save time? Let's kind of summarize everything here all together. Um, this slide has a few more uh, buckets on it th than our original. So this is the simulation process today. Remember, it's geometry down at the bottom, geometry to pre-processing, external solver to post-processing. I do have some additional intermediate things that are there that you're well aware of. So where do we save time? Well, one, since everything is integrated, I save a lot of time just managing all those external files. That's actually a significant time saving and saves me headaches. Uh, additionally, because of the integrated solver and because of the analysis readiness capability, the 
cycles that I went through to validate my model to get rid of fatal error messages and such, that just happens automatically in Apex, leveraging that integrated solver and the integrated solver methods. So that's a big time savings that I made. I'm also going to save time. Remember, you just saw me uh, use results expiration to ask some what if questions so that I didn't have to actually do that with changes to the model and run the whole model again. Okay, So results exploration allows me to ask what if questions, confirm my intuition, and so therefore it's going to reduce the number of design changes that I might need to make to get the results within acceptable limits. All right. Not only do I reduce the number of design changes that I have to do, uh, but those design changes are generative. I mean, as I was making changes to the model, notice that when I translated the uh, partition, when I moved it a little bit, the connection between it and the internal piping there automatically updated. So I not only reduce the number of design changes I have to make, when I do have to make them, they are generative which effectively means that I don't have to do every individual step. Many of these steps happen automatically for me. Occasionally I might make a change that breaks something, but Apex is going to tell me about it. Okay? It's not going to let me find out when I submit it to the solver. So what have we seen today? Well, hopefully you've seen that Apex really is simulation reinvented. It is easy to learn and easy to use. You don't hear those words often with computer-aided engineering. Uh, software, but um, with the technology that's within MSC Apex, that's absolutely true. And a big part of that is the way we interact with the model, the natural drags, the pushing and pulling operations on the geometry and mesh. The automatic model updates are going to save you a lot of time, as well as the solver validated modeling. In other words, the integrated solver letting me know that this model's not going to run. That's saving me time. I'll also save some time with a modern parts-based solution, more process-centric rather than solver-centric. And we also got to see results exploration. Uh, one thing we didn't have time for today is to talk about how extensible Apex is via Python scripting. And it has rich APIs and an open plug-in architecture. Uh, and with the extensible nature of Apex, it really takes your computer-aided engineering process. It really integrates it with full vehicle analysis, not just a parts-centric approach to analysis. And the net result is huge productivity gains, which will hopefully be more profits, better designs, and higher raises for the people on the call. So what have you seen? You've seen that Apex is fun. All right, My daughter, she watches me use Apex, and she thinks it's a game. Okay, It's not. It's very serious. But We've actually made it easy to use and easy to learn, which does make it feel more fun. It's award-winning. Uh, it really is simulation reinvented. You just got a small snapshot today. Uh, and it is an enabler. It enables productivity because you're going to take less time to do what you do. It's going to cost you less, more profits, better designs. And for you on the call today, you're kind of like me. You want to look good. It's going to make you look good. And you're not going to have to work through lunch to get the uh, margins that your boss is requesting. So let's see if my analysis is complete. It is. All right. We're just going to take a quick look. Srinivas, I'm just about ready. Uh, for questions, and we'll look at the results real quick. Originally, the uh, maximum response of the exhaust pipe was 6,000 millimeters per second. I knew I had confirmed with the results exploration that making those partitions stiffer, increasing that frequency, really would uh, reduce this response, and I see that it absolutely has. I went from 6,000 to 4,500 millimeters per second squared, and all I did was change one partition. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Do we have any questions?